He's got global responsibility for all of our enterprise architecture activities, uh, TOGAF, Archimate, and so on. He's based in Shanghai, and he's responsible for business functions in that region. Before joining the Open Group, um, Chris was uh, worked at American Express as Vice President for Strategy and Architecture, their customer servicing capability. And he brings with us, with him, uh, a huge amount of experience of enterprise architecture in a large financial enterprise. And also a large amount of experience in how the organization functions in a large enterprise like that, like American Express. So in this session, he's going to look at the value of TOGAF architecture for TOGAF ADM and open systems architecture. So please give a big warm open group welcome, Chris Ford. Okay. Uh, I've been asked to uh, curb my Irish tendency to wander around so that the camera can stay on me, so I'll try and stay in approximately this area. Um, I want you, if you have access to the internet right now, to go to the Open Group homepage. And on the Open Group homepage, in the header bar, is an events link. Okay, so click on the header bar link to get you to the landing page for the events. It's a beautiful little page. It's got four graphics basically in the middle. And right below the left hand graphic is a link for past events. And you can click on that. And that's going to take you to essentially a menu of all the previous open group events back to 2005. And as a member organization, it's going to take you with your login authorization from your company email ID. It'll enable you to go in and assess some of the assertions that uh, are going to be made in this presentation about the value of using the TOGAF ADM and open architectures. So there's not a lot of case study material in the presentation I'm going to give to you today, but I'm trying to give you access to things that I believe support what is in these, uh, is in these presentations. Oh, there's an instruction manual for this clicker. This should be forward. Okay. So actually, this presentation was uh, put together by a gentleman by the name of Terry Blevins. Um, Terry's an, a very, uh, I, he would hate for me to describe him this way. I, I think of Terry as a sweet man. He's a nice, nice guy. This is kind of sweet along the lines of John Zachman when you got him over a cup of coffee to type of thing, right? Nice people. But Terry is also a very smart guy, okay? And he's been around the Open Group a long time. We recently... Uh, gave him a position of fellow of the open group. Um, and he's recently retired from the MITRE Corporation. He was scheduled to give this presentation, uh, but he's moving house. So he asked uh, somebody from the team to, to do the presentation. That's, that's why I'm here. He's also uh, uh, an elected uh, rep for the uh, governing board, vice chair of the board. He's been involved with the discipline since the 80s. Uh, and he's been around the Open Group since 96, which preceded me by about 10 years. My first exposure to the Open Group was uh, in Barcelona in January of 2006. Uh, he's been past chair of several areas of the Open Group, the Architecture Forum, Certification Working Group. Um, and he has a deep background in enterprise architecture. Okay. So the center graphic here is, uh, I think, labeled by NASA as uh, the pillars of heaven. Some people call it the fingers of God. Uh, enterprise architecture is a journey, and it's a constant journey. Okay, And sometimes it can feel like you're trying to get your head around the universe. When John was going through his material earlier, when you see some of the presentations, the degree of complexity of, our, of organizations or of objects like an aircraft is enormous. And you need
need some way to deal with that. But it's not a one-stop shop. It's a journey of activity. Now, the ADM uh, from TOGAF, the Architecture Development Method, and the framework that John just took you through, the ontology, uh, provide guidance about how to navigate through that journey. Um, but they're not, they're not mathematically correct, and they're not quantum physics types of things. Uh, so there's some degree, as you go through the method, okay, of judgment that needs to be made. So uh, hopefully after we get through these slides, you'll have a sense of where to look for value when you're navigating your way through the ADM. Because having something that is a method doesn't give you experience in it, right? So having somebody point out to you a little bit about where to look for the value is useful. And that's why I pointed you to the case study material that's available to you um, as a member organization, but also as attendees here, all of the presentations will be posted within the next two weeks or so, and you'll be able to log in and get access to those presentations and use them in the future. So uh, architecture is a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. And it requires understanding of the right places to standardize and focus. And taking the journey helps you identify those areas. So these are the major graphical components of the architecture of the uh, TOGAF framework. Uh, the ADM itself, which is primarily where we're going to spend our attention here. The content framework, reference models of various kinds, uh, the guidelines and techniques, the continuum of uh, you know, what is an industry thing versus what is uh, specific to your organization, and a capability framework. Now, uh, the TOGAF standard in the f is designed actually to swap in and swap out things in these areas. If you have something that works for your company and you've done a lot of design and delivery around that and it's part of the practice and it's useful to you, TOGAF is designed to be, uh, to be customized, particularly in these areas, and a lot, most organizations do absolutely do a lot of customization. Coverage areas, we've got uh, the general introduction, we've got the development where we'll spend most of our time on, uh, the content framework, continuum, well, I just covered that stuff, I just overviewed it anyway. Okay, so uh, architecture is only a paperweight unless you get down to using it to make decisions, making informed decisions, gathering the information necessary for yourself as an architect and for decision makers in the organization is a critical component of being an architect. So enterprise architecture and the architectures have potential value. And realization of that value requires sound decision making. And not necessarily always with a complete set of information, which Alan alluded to and John alluded to. He's indicated in, in the Zuckman framework, you can go a mile deep and a mile wide, or you go an inch deep. And maybe that's all you need to know right now to make your advancement, to move forward a little bit. So here's the... Uh, the development method from TOGAF, uh, it's an iterative method. So you may go in, let's say in phase A, around visioning, you check off against all the stuff in the middle, you go back out, you go down a circle, you go back in and out and around. Th this, this graphic does not infer, although sometimes people do infer, you go in at the top, go down into A, go all the way around, and that's the way you do it. That's absolutely not typically how it's used. Okay. It helps through each phase and iteration, enables the delivery and the decision-making process to become improved. Okay. It can have enterprise coverage, levels of detail, time, and architecture and solution asset reuse. Decisions based on competence, resource availability, value. You could put scope in there. There's a lot of things in terms of the, the, the question is, 
do you have a decision-making framework in place in the enterprise and as an architect? So from the ADM phases, we're going to look at what rocks to look under, value potential, and what to look out for in terms of openness. In the preliminary phase, uh, the value potential here that's listed is cost avoidance. And a lot of people do architecture for that purpose. Uh, most organizations these days are not just looking at cost avoidance, they're looking at value realization and cost avoidance at the same time. Delivering more capability at lower cost with higher outcomes on the capability side at the end of that mechanism. This is a very tough road to walk. One of the uh, value potential here, though, is having a method that's uh, repeatable and uh, managed professionally. Often I was just talking about certification of programs. Uh, I should feel pretty good because John was talking to Rolf too, so there's six degrees of separation thing here going on. Anyway, all right. Um, and building the architecture competency over time. As different architects, different people, different leaders go through these processes, all of them are individuals and they're all learning different competency levels, different skill and will, all of these things. But iterating through frameworks with guidance, taxonomy and ontology allows you to improve the competencies of people and the quality of the end products over time. So what you can look for in terms of looking under rocks is uh, decision making models, organizational models that do and don't work, enterprise elements, and corporate strategies. Um, Ed Roberts made a point to me yesterday evening about uh, that these days, architects in the preliminary and the visionary phases are actually not just looking at their own enterprises. They're often looking at the ecosystem in which those organizations operate. The external factors that are influencing either on the technology side or the business strategy side, but this depends on how the architect is actually plugged into the organization, of course. One of the questions to answer here is where is change needed and how to impact decision making and thinking. And looking for openness in the way decision making standards are set for means, methods, and measures. Now, in the preliminary phase, an instance of that that was presented on fairly recently, um, and I know that the, the Nationwide folks presented here yesterday afternoon, was from a member company Nationwide. So if you dig into that material I pointed you to at the beginning here, you can actually see some of the content that I'm making a reference to. Okay, and in each, each one of these areas, I'm gonna mention an organization that has presented on what they've been doing in this space. So the value potential in the visioning side is uh, really getting pretty specific about scoping your architecture projects, trust development with the decision makers, where whatever work is being done is aligned to their needs. We heard about that conversation earlier. Realignment of transformation initi initiatives, that is, are you making the best use of the investment that's going on and can you use in-flight activities to further the goals of the organization that may not be optimized but could be effectively used to deliver value? And how those are related as um, regular P&L cycle projects against the big transformation initiatives that may be going on concurrently. So things to look for under the rocks, current architecture material, capabilities and maturity of your architecture and your architecting capabilities, current view of stakeholder concerns and how the business works. Um, Alan mentioned large enterprises and um, I've observed not only in the one I've worked in and others I've worked in, because I haven't just worked at one large organization, I have worked at multiple, um, many, many times we talk about the business as some sort of monolithic thing, and it isn't. It's a lot of little things with a lot of connections in it, and a lot of people who have moved from this department to that department and this area to that
that area cross-functionally building. They're moving uh, perhaps on as frequent a basis as every 18 months, either through reorganization, promotion, upskilling, or whatever. So the reality of how much people know about their own functional area depends a lot on how long they've been there and how many people they're managing, how complex the processes are, and they may know their own little piece, but they don't necessarily know the end-to-end -end process. They will tell you they do, but discovering whether they do or not is actually a very interesting, <laughs> interesting process, okay? So questions to answer, what is appropriate from the architecture visioning perspective? How does one measure success? And success um, varies from perspective to perspective or view to view. And what business transformations are actually needed? Again, looking for openness in the way business models are represented and processes and standards are represented. So back to the process. If you're trying to connect the customer relationship management individuals who are on the phone with the fact that if they don't process a complained activity and you're in a financial institution, you can face fines of up to 100,000 US dollars if you let that complaint linger more than 30 days. Now, managing that activity, getting it dealt with in the time frame required to mitigate the opportunity for you to be fined, and figuring out all the processes that have to be connected can be a very, very complex activity, okay? But the people in the departments who are connected through the organization don't necessarily have the end-to-end -end view of that. That stuff has grown organically over time. It's not engineered. It's not designed. It's been dealt with because of regulation firefighting. For the business phase, Value potential is in organization process improvement, inventory of business systems, and clearly understanding goals and objectives. You can look for current architecture detail, organizational model details, and business partner interaction. What processes are in most need of support or clarity? What will drive the transformation and candidates for change? Now, we talk about change as if, well, everybody is completely motivated to do it. Actually, that's not my experience. Some people are motivated to change and a lot of people are motivated to protect their turf. So managing the politics of this stuff is incredibly difficult and uh, an interesting soft skill from a, an architect's perspective. The methodology is not going to help you there. You just need politically savvy people working well. And you may need a mandate to force change. So in this space, I would refer you to the uh, Nissan presentation. And in the uh, visioning space, Deutsche Telekom, who uh, helped with the presentation on their five-year transformation activity. For information systems, value potential, obviously, in lower costs, you know, application rationalization, reducing redundant uh, application data, <coughs> excuse me, and transparency of costs. Looking for openness in application, the standards, development, OS interfaces, data and information retrieval management, storage and standards in those areas. Um, a lot of these standards tend to be fragmented, fractured, disconnected, so the database standards and the application integration standards and the, all of these things may not be, and, in, and typically are not, coordinated and governed effectively in the way John described. You see the governance occurring. You're going to change this? What are the downstream? Where do the cowbells ring when you pull on the street? So what applications uh, are there? How do they work? What are the data and info objects? And how do we assume and ensure quality information security? How do we assert that these things are secure and how do we prove that? So in the information system space, GM made a presentation at the Open. This was back in 2006. But what they were presenting on was how they drive, how they drove to the North Star implementation. Okay. Now, each of the presentations I'm mentioning could actually
actually be referenced in any one of these areas. Okay? They go soup to nuts through this process. But the presentations are geared to emphasize a particular segment of their architecture activity. But generally speaking, they're outcome oriented from a business perspective. On the technology side, and this may not be information technology oriented, because that's one of the reasons I mentioned GM just now and Nissan earlier. Um, and it could be any one of the oil and gas organizations that are presented. Or, uh, you know, there's a lot of, for example, Devon Energy. There's a lot of technology that is not IT technology in most organizations, and their core business is not necessarily IT. It's digging stuff out of the ground or sending things under the ocean or all sorts of different things. Okay, so value potential, competitive advantage, greater choice and flexibility, lower cost of integration, low, low, uh, lower total cost of ownership. Looking for current technology architecture details, assessments, current quality measures, user feedback, and data and information availability. How do we ensure that the technical components are fit? Fit to each other, fit for purpose. What technologies need to be in the foundation? We're looking for openness between technology components, hardware and software, networking, interface standards, this sort of thing. Now, one of the areas of the open groups activities that are, is pretty exciting for me is the work that's going on in the IT for IT forum, where these kinds, I believe, these kinds of questions are being dealt with. Okay? If you look at this from an IT perspective, So in the technology space, uh, the reference presentation here is uh, from Jake Sims at Cathay Pacific, which is a tier one global airline, heavily invested in staying in that position and in levering technology in a broad-based way, not just from an IT systems perspective. Okay. So open architecture. Uh, Taking the journey, each part contributes to understanding where to apply openness, but what is open systems architecture and why is it important? The instance that uh, Terry's using here, and I'm not deeply familiar with this, I would say I'm superficially familiar with it from the slide, okay, is the US Navy instance. Uh, the Office of Submarines adopted an open architecture approach for sonar. They modularized the sonar system, they disclosed designs of the architecture, they published the interfaces, and they increased competition among suppliers. They generated a significant cost savings, a reduction in development and production costs by a factor of six, a reduction in operating and support costs by a factor of eight, and then we have the infamous cost avoidance measure. Um, this uh, cost avoidance stuff goes uh, in and out of favor most organizations I've been in, it's been out of favor for some substantial period of time. Uh, One million in technical manuals, two million in direct inventory, 19 million in interactive, and three million in outfit, outfitting spares and reduction. So this is an outline case. The, the uh, organizational presentations I mentioned are other cases that demonstrate these kinds of things, but not necessarily from a cost reduction perspective, but from a capability delivery perspective. So Terry believes that open architectures are important. Uh, this is one that specifies open standards as its basis, especially when describing the interrelationships, principles, and guidelines. Uh, open standards are those that are specified and available for open uh, implementation by all and managed in an open forum. And these kinds of architectures are necessary for free information flow across dynamically changing environments for flexibility of solutions and to avoid lock-in. That the architecture is more likely to be open if it's developed in an open forum manner using an open method. And that the forum does not necessarily mean open to all, but it means open to as many views as is practical. Now, in this case, Terry is not talking about the open group. He's talking about the open forum within the enterprise that is developing the basis for their open architecture. The open group is absolutely open to all. I want to make that clear. 
an open architecture will only be effective if the appropriate formalities are in place to ensure that the builders of the systems and the systems architecture components follow the architecture. So governance is key. I think that was one of the first questions John answered earlier in the Q&A session after his presentation. An open architecture is a means to an end. Open solutions that meet operational needs for the business are critical. Um, through open architectures, uh, I clicked on this link at the bottom here, this uh, do.mil, and was immediately challenged. I was surprised at the degree of challenge to get in there. I thought some guy was going to show up and whisk me away, but they didn't. So this is an open forum community uh, for development of open systems architectures. They set rules for acquisition and technical data rights, case analysis, engineering trade analysis for open systems architecture and data rights. So this is a, a military forum for doing so. So preconditions for success. You need the will to transform the enterprise. You need decision-making processes and governance for IT investment. Decision makers' commitment to use the enterprise architecture. This is one of the way areas in which uh, folks need to be willing uh, in the governance mechanism to police well. That doesn't mean police everything aggressively. It means appropriately in terms of the governance structures. You need flexible governance for flexible environments and business. It's very, very um, inappropriate, in my opinion, to be the guy with the axe all the time in the governance mechanism. It's a sure way to get your practice uh, based on what I've observed um, buried and eventually reconstituted. Uh, decision makers commitment to use the enterprise architecture and their commitment to fund incremental development of architecture and standards. Uh, Terry's indicating here that uh, EA is a critical success factor for IT alignment. Um, it's, it is, uh, but it's about the journey, not the destination. The benefits are clear. Fewer and fewer organizations are spending time justifying why they have an enterprise architecture team any more than they spend time justifying why they have purchasing teams or accounting teams or software development teams. Where and how those activities should be done and how they are funded is a regular conversation during the uh, spending cycle for the organization. But fewer and fewer organizations are having to argue about whether they should have or should not have architects in role managed in a human resources manner as opposed to just kind of fudge things out. Uh, it's a business management tool. Actually, I have a presentation around this. I do mostly in Asia Pacific, asserting that EA is a management tool and not a technology tool, an IT-oriented tool. Um, so I, I fully support the perspective that John was proposing around that. And in fact, in China, where they are trying to revamp their economy, it's precisely for that purpose of transforming their economy that they are coming to the enterprises of all kinds, are coming to the open group to understand the expertise of folks like you who are in this room that have been doing this for a number of years, or for decades in the case of some of us, okay? They're coming to this thing looking at it beyond the IT impact. They're looking about how they transform, for example, their manufacturing industry, how they compete globally in commercial aviation, how they secure their supply chains. It uh, is about providing a roadmap for openness and success to your future, and leverage is key. Much uh, to be done about the architecting discipline to get it uh, more provable, right? Uh, becoming a pioneer, uh, I wouldn't call this pioneering anymore in terms of architecture. But that's my personal pers perspective. But in terms of leading in the space of enterprise architecture from an open standards perspective, the open group is an excellent location to come to for that purpose. Um, steering the way which uh, 
uh, the premier architecture methodology and framework, which I will assert TOGAF is, through the open group is a very good way to ensure that architecture, its discipline and development is relevant to your company as a professional discipline moving forward. That is the end of the presentation. I was intending to make up the time that we had uh, gotten away from. Uh, hopefully, you found this useful. Um, there's a lot of assertions in here, which is why I put forward the material for you to reference uh, from the website. So you can go in and look at the case studies of people applying this stuff. Um, but they don't often talk about how they internally develop and deliver standards. So I'll mention one in particular. Uh, TJ Verdi from Boeing made a presentation, I think, last year about how Boeing uses the architecture development method of the open group to manage and control its standards. Okay, And it's a very interesting presentation, a very interesting presentation. I'd recommend it if you, if you locate it. It's one of the quarterly presentations from last year. Another presentation was made up in essentially the same track by uh, another member company, TCS, about how the, they are using the uh, uh, methodology to do innovation planning for their clients. Okay, So um, the methodology can be used in many interesting ways other than just how do you get another computer on somebody's desk. But how do you manage a data center? Okay, with that, I think I'll wrap up and uh, 